My talk, as I saw it advertised, is electrical stimulation for spasticity and gait or mobility or something like that. Um, so I'm going to I'm modified it slightly, and I'm going to um, be presenting some information on spasticity. My major emphasis is on motor learning or motor control sort of thing. Uh, and I'll also be talking about some FES, functional electrical stimulation programs as well. One thing you should know is there is no evidence that ele uh, electrical stimulation on the surface of the skin has any increase in potential for your children to have, epile or have a, um, a, a episode. Um, so that was one thing that we were very careful with um, when things first got started. So with that in mind, then we'll just go ahead and start. And I'm going to talk about what I call facilitation or others would might call motor control. Um, and the areas we're going to talk about is, and, and I kind of opened this up to technology because we're going to talk about some bi EMG biofeedback as well as positional feedback. Um, and uh, we're also going to talk about some dynamic orthotic training, which is a really, really nice way to get a lot of therapy done in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and we have the equipment now that is somewhat available for that purpose, so we're going to talk about that. Um, for inhibition, we can use EMG also, and I will talk about the use of uh, electrical stimulation for spasticity management, okay? Um, if at any point in time you have uh, questions about what I'm talking about, feel free to interrupt. I have no problems with that. So, um, when we add electrical stimulation to any kind of a voluntary effort, um, and this is true in individuals who would be considered motor control normal or, or individuals who may have a neurologic impairment in their motor control, we are increasing the sensory drive on those motor neurons and making it easier when the patient tries to recruit the motor neurons, the motor neurons are already excited so it's, the thresholds have dropped, it's more easily um, excited, and so people who have sort of marginal descending control uh, and can't do a whole lot, um, if you use stimulation either as a primer or as an active ingredient of the treatment program, um, then you can have, you can make it much easier for your children to be able to activate the system on their own. So I, I noticed that I say if done properly, especially if you're trying to use stimulation during functional activity, you gotta do it right. You gotta hit them at the right time for that to be a useful training program. So if you're trying to train a, a, a son or a daughter to walk, to open their hand, to do whatever, and you're using uh, stimulation as a dynamic orthosis, then whoever is triggering that stimulation has to do it quite precisely. If you don't, you're kind of fouling up the whole process and taking it out of the um, uh, realm of facilitation. Uh, stimulation provides proprioceptive cues through the 1A and 1B afferents. Those are sensory afferents that are in the muscles. And they tell the, the uh, motor neurons, it's now is the time to contract or not, okay? So we enhance both the local spinal cord reflexes and the remote cortical and cerebellar processing activation. I'm gonna talk a little bit towards the end about what we know now, which is, is kind of new, uh, about how the brain processes electrical stimulation signals. That fMRI studies are demonstrating that stimulation is having huge impact on how your, your brain is processing movement attempts and uh, for both single session and multiple session training. So we'll talk about that just a little bit later. One of the first ways that we can use our, our, our stimulation as an orthotic training. Now, how many of you have seen something like this, a dorsiflexion assist for gait? Yeah, okay, and this, there's two different uh, stimulators on the market. This is a tilt sensor, and I like this because it allows um, excellent positioning for the limb before the stimulation is excited. 
and it gives a lot of functional retraining. When should the muscles be starting? And it doesn't require that you stand there with a hand switch and turn it on, turn it off. You certainly can do that. But if you have uh, this kind of device, it, I do like to use it under supervision because it is what's referred to as a tilt sensor. And I'm going to get off my microphone here for a minute. Sorry. Should, should I take this one? Yeah, that's great. Purple one. Is it on? Doesn't sound like it's on. Okay. So normally in gait, when you're going to unload your limb, you have a forward limb posture on the other side and your trailing limb uh, flexes at the knee. This is what is the trigger for this particular uh, stimulator. And it does it automatically um, as long as you get into that position. I like it a lot because it allows the individual to be successful when they're in the posture that you want them to be. Okay? If they're taking little tiny steps, it doesn't work. They have to get a, a forward momentum step. So I do prefer to use it under supervision. I've had my patients tell me, um, it works except when I'm in the kitchen because I'm sidestepping along the counter in the kitchen. It doesn't work because there's no trail in my posture. Or I have one uh, patient that's told me, it doesn't work when I'm uh, window shopping at the mall because I'm just really taking slow little steps so that I can see everything in the window. And it never gets into a trail in my position. But for training, um, I really like this one because it lets, I can put on, on a child and have them walk, and as long as I'm somewhere in the area, I can give them the verbal encouragement that they might need, um, and I can see them moving around on their own without anybody at their heels, and it's really kind of exciting for them, okay? So um, if, and I, I've seen a lot of our kids walking around here and they have, um, sometimes they have pretty good trailing limb posture, but they don't always have the dorsiflexion component. So they're, they're kind of hip hiking uh, to get their foot around, or they're, they're circumducting, circumducting to get their foot around, okay? And dorsiflexion assist can uh, work with that. And if it's something that they can wear, they can do it a fair amount of the time. Okay, so as a training technique, that's very effective. However, um, the other thing about using the dorsiflexion assist, and we ran into this with many of our different patients, was that um, if you give them good dorsiflexion, they're gonna make heel contact. And when they make heel contact, they're going to increase the load on the calf muscles. So if the calf muscles aren't strong enough, then you're gonna wind up with the knee collapsing, okay? So you have to have good, strong uh, calf muscles, but still have that drop foot problem, and that works with this stimulator pretty well. And I like it because I can put it on and I can have them walk all day, um, and they're getting therapy all day long, whether they're with me or whether they're with another therapist or whether they're uh, at home with mom and dad, it doesn't matter. Okay, so um, I don't really care for a 24-7, well, they wouldn't be on a 24-7, but under a totally unsupervised position because of the differences of when it doesn't turn on um, if they don't get into the proper position. But I start them with a session using the stimulation in the appropriate way, getting the appropriate forward progression, and then let them go from there. And sometimes I have to refresh in the middle of the day so that they know get, take a full big step on the, on the forward limb. Um, so this has been very effective. Um, when I first began doing electrical stimulation, which we will not say when that was because some of you weren't even alive yet, <laughs> um, we were doing this kind of stimulation, but we were doing it with an implant. And we discovered that many of our patients learn how to do the task without the implant. But then we had the implant in there, so what were we going to do? Um, it was basically that basis that we started using the surface stimulation as a treatment assessment. 
Um, and so this is not new, this goes back in the 60s, but it's a, a very nice toy to play with. How many of you have tried looking at one of the two of these sorts of collection sets that are, and what kind of price tag did you get? Uh, we were actually the first ones that our insurance decided to cover. Oh good, excellent. So that's- Lots of letters. Yes. So I don't know exactly. Yeah. So in, in um, that case, when you have something that's kind of on the cutting edge, I find that if I, the therapist, to write a letter and say, I've been using this device for the last X number of days, the patient is showing good progress, and I need him to be able to continue using the device for another month or two months or three months, because my goal really is that I'm not gonna have to use it forever. Okay, I'm using it as a training device. It's a very dynamic training device. And so it can be very effective um, because it's used so much independently, okay? Um, other forms of electrical stimulation. Upper extremity wrist and elbow uh, NMES. NMES, by the way, is neuromuscular electrical stimulation. And we use that term when we're looking at something that we expect to be training um, that the, we're anticipating the individual will be able to take over the function without continuous use of the stimulation. Okay, we'll talk about long-term management a little bit later. Okay. Um, so again, watching all of our youngsters running around here, what's the position of their arm and hand? They're slightly abducted, the elbow's flexed, and the wrist is just slack. Okay. Or, yeah, sometimes it's actively curved, but most of what I see is the hand, the hand is just slack. Um, and I don't want to put them in a big brace because some of them have finger flexion, but down here it's not terribly functional. Okay? So, uh, using electrical stimulation, again, there is an orthosis that you can use that you just kind of clamp it on the arm, and it sets up four channels of stimulation, all in the forearm, in the hand. Okay? That, the orthosis doesn't allow you to go to the elbow. Or you can do a two-channel stimulation, which is kind of the conventional stimulator that's around and available. And you can do the wrist and finger extensors together and work on elbow extensors as well. Now this kind of comes into our discussion about spasticity, but a lot of these um, uh, dangling arms are really positional. They're not spasticity. There's, there's not a lot of, I don't perceive a lot of tone in them. So if we can um, help them learn to contract the muscles when they need to be contracting and relax them when they need to be relaxed, then you may have some ability to control that hand posture and allow the hand to be somewhat more functional. If we can get some wrist extension, we can let their, their grip be functional. Question, did I have a question? No, okay. Yes? I mean, who's making, I, I've never seen a device for the wrist and elbow. What, who's making those devices? There's, there's no specific device for the wrist and elbow. Uh, Bioness has a device for the hand, the wrist and, and uh, hand. Okay. But uh, wrist and elbow, any conventional two-channel simulator would work. Okay. Um, so our goal here is to improve their motor control so that they don't have to use it forever. Now, the, the, um, the neurologic damage may be done and you may have to use um, starter sessions, if you will. So when I first start off any of these folks on uh, hand control or, or dress flexion control for that matter, I usually use an intensive training program with the therapist involving function and I do that for maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks. We see they're gaining function and then we can start doing a primer session with the stimulation and let them go do their same functional activities without the stimulation. And I wean them off of the stimulation. When I have patients um, who have uh, a need for it, I will uh, have a stimulator sent home 
and they can use it maybe once or twice a week in order to allow the extremity to remain in a relaxed position and the hand be positioned more appropriately for, for function. Okay, so it's not, it's not a quick little, it's gonna fix it in a minute, but it is something that you can keep working with and as, as your child grows and they hit growth spurts, then you know from your other kids, kids are awkward in their growth spurts. Right, and your, your uh, child with epilepsy is no different from that. Um, so as they hit a growth spurt, you might need to use the stimulation more intensively again for a short time, and then um, move them off of it again until they hit the next growth spurt, okay? Um, so you don't need <coughs> expensive equipment to do. You, there is expensive equipment out there if you wanna try it, but you don't need that. Um, the two-channel stimulators are basically running around $200 to $300. So it's not um, a huge fit to your pocket. And again, if your therapist writes a note that says, we've been doing this and this is the progress that we're seeing, generally um, insurance companies will say, yeah, let's do this. Okay? So hand position. Um, <coughs> both in relaxed state and in functional state. So I'm impressed with how much finger function many of these children have, but because the hand is kind of in an awkward position, it's not really functional. They have finger ability, but it's not terribly functional. So if we can get the uh, elbow relaxed and we can get the wrist into a slightly neutral position, then we can start making better use of that, okay? All right. Okay, so let's talk about stimulation and spasticity. Um, stimulation is not a long-term fix for spasticity. And I wanted to say that because I noticed that the, ta the title of my talk is spasticity and motor learning. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we know long-term management of spasticity, stimulation is not your choice. If you're having a problem after a surgery or something uh, and you need to control some uh, extra tone, then stimulation might be appropriate. But uh, we know that stimulation works. There's no question about that, but it has a temporary effect. And that temporary effect is measured in minutes. It's not measured in hours usually. So um, if you, you, know, you can't get your kid's foot in their shoe uh, using some stimulation, could relax it, get a foot in the shoe, and then tie it up. That may or may not be useful for you. Um, but for using stimulation to manage long-term spasticity, like what I'm seeing in the, in the elbows, are they kind of here? They've got a lot of biceps tone. So um, could I use stimulation to relax that tone? Absolutely, I can, but I'm not gonna get a long-term effect unless I put it on for a long, long time. Because the effect is dominantly going to occur during the time of stimulation and for a short time thereafter. So that's not usually one of the things that I try to, to concentrate on with spasticity management. It's just a temporary uh, way of dealing with tone. Let's use it. Yeah, go ahead. Use it with Botox or something like that? Yeah, actually, uh, the question is, can you use it with Botox? Actually, there's a few studies out that show, and we do this in our, in our Botox clinic at Rancho, um, if you use stimulation immediately after Botox, and you stimulate the muscle that has, been, has received the Botox, it actually increases the amount of that neuroblocker to the myoneural junction. And so your effect of the Botox is enhanced. And so you get a better Botox block that lasts for a longer period of time, but then the next day or two, we'll go to the antagonist. So when we're talking about stimulation for spasticity management, we're usually talking about stimulating the muscle opposite the one that's in, in has spasticity in it. So if you've got this elbow flexion here, my market of, or my target of choice would be the triceps, the elbow extensors. And if I have a hand that's, that's into a lot of flexion, 
my target is to move it into extension. So I'm going to use the stimulation on the extensors, not on the flexors. There are programs that work on st by stimulating the muscle that is in spasm or has spasticity, but it's not as um, persistent and consistent. So the consistent uh, program that works is to go to the antagonist. Then again, what you're doing is you're actually physically um, changing the excitability of the motor neuron pool of the muscle that's spastic, and you're inhibiting it at the level of spinal cord. So you, we have a neural lack of rationale of why both that it works and that it works only temporarily. Okay, so we can kind of understand that. So that helps us identify um, <laughs> when, uh, when we want to have a, a, an effect of spasticity, for spasticity management. So it's not a long-term fix. It can be a spot treatment. Um, and usually I like to stimulate for at least 10 minutes before I expect to see this neurologic relaxation that occurs. Um, because it's kind of like there's all this extra tone being driven down onto the alpha motor neurons, the motor neurons that move the, the muscle and cause the spasticity. And we have to reverse that. Um, so the descending influence from the cortex is causing the spasticity. We're creating a spinal reflex uh, that's going to counter that. And so it's going to be effective while we're doing that stimulation. Once we take the stimulation away, there's no counter anymore. Okay? So spasticity is not a long-term management program. Then we have um, some real fancy toys now. We have robotic assisted gait. That's really exciting. Um, it actually is a mechanized treatment that was used back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s and fell into very ill repute back at that time frame um, because it wasn't very effective. And so we have to be really careful with robotic uh, assisted activities. Whether it's upper extremity, whether it's lower extremity, it doesn't matter. Um, I, we, we have a, a quote unquote robo camp at um, Rancho every summer for a select group of uh, the hemispherectomy kids. And I stepped through a session where one of the kids that was in this device, the local mat, um, and I watched the therapist, the, the, the patient sees this, but the therapist has a unit over here, and I watched her watch that, <coughs> and the goal was to increase the dorsiflexion, to get the toe clearance. And so she was watching the screen, and the patient was watching the screen. And the patient figured out a way he could get that foot up on the screen without working his dorsiflexors. <laughs> and she didn't catch it. So she taught him a very effective way to hip hike. And she didn't do what she thought she was going to do. Now, I like the stimulation in the, the robotic um, because the robot moving the extremity is basically passive. And passive doesn't really provide very much sensory information to the brain. So we're not really modifying how they learn to move. And that's the reason that patterning became such a, a, a bad treatment a program in the 50s, 60s, is that all these people were helping a, uh, an individual move their extremities in a normal pattern, but the individual was not working with it. So it wasn't a training program. It was an exercise for five people working with a child to try and make them move more normally. But it didn't work. The same thing is true with the Bobo. If we don't have them work with it, then they're not getting enough sensory information to make it work. And I've had therapists tell me, well, I don't like them to work with it because then they get out of play and I have to stop and restart again. OK, work that out. You know, having them not work with it is not a very effective treatment. But with a channel of dorsiflexion and a channel of knee extension, um, this could be a very powerful treatment, and it has been a very powerful treatment, but you've got to be careful. You have to watch who's doing it, because sometimes they're not doing it quite the way you would like them to be doing it. Okay? 
Um, and at the end of this talk, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about you as, ther as patients and therapists have, are responsible for making sure that all this technology is used correctly because the technology itself is not going to create the motor learning and motor control that you want your children to have. It's the combination of the technology with the therapeutic background and the functional activity that's going to make a difference in how you're, you teach your, your child's brain to move their extremities. So um, robotics is interesting. It gives us assisted movement, and it's augmenting internal cues, especially if we, have, we provide proprioception uh, through neuromuscular electrical stimulation. Okay, much more so than if the extremity is just being moved around in a, a gait pattern. So the patient needs to participate and the therapist needs to pay attention to what's going on and we need to make sure that we're training what we think we're training. So we're not training hip hikers instead of dorsiflexors. Now, moving off of more of the therapeutic side, going into um, the orthotic side, so after a trial with the dorsiflexion assist, if it turns out that your patient, your son, your daughter, whatever, doesn't, uh, cannot learn to dorsiflex the foot, there's just not enough strength there or there's not enough uh, coordination there, then we look at a, a true dynamic <coughs> orthosis. And again, we were doing dynamic orthoses back in the 60s, and it worked very well. The big problem was we didn't have good surface stimulation systems, so everything was being done by implant, which didn't turn out to be very well. But now this is, again, another commercially available uh, stimulator. This one is using a foot switch. They don't like it to call it a foot switch. That's what it is. It goes inside the shoe and it tells the machine when the foot is on the ground. And when the foot is on the ground, then the simulator turns off, and as he takes a step through and the heel comes off, then he'll pick his, it, it'll start the stimulation to bring up his dorsiflexors. So this one I do like to use in the community because of the foot switch. It's much safer. If they're doing little tiny steps, it doesn't matter. You're still unweighting the heel, so it's still going to turn on at the appropriate time. If you're walking side to side, it's still going to turn on because the foot switch is there. Okay. So this particular unit, if I want somebody to have to, to use dorsiflexion assist throughout the day, this is a better choice. Um, I like the tilt sensor for training. I like this one for safety. Okay. So we can do the same things with the upper extremity. However, none of the or upper extremity um, orthotics are designed for long-term use. So they're, you, they're designed to be put on and used for an hour or two and taken off. Okay. They're, not used, they're not designed to be usable for the full day. So that makes them more of a, a training device than a, a true orthotic de device. I, I said we started with this in the 60s. We were doing some pretty invasive sur surgery to put the electrodes uh, onto the nerves where we needed to, to be. One thing that's happening now um, is that we, we're getting technology that allows us to put little tiny simulators into really small little spots with a um, needle. Okay, so we don't have to do an open surgery. We don't have to find the nerve. We can put it in, into, uh, into a place near the nerve, and we can do it with a stimulating uh, needle and then slide the implant right in. So uh, basically, we've involved, been involved at Rancho with this kind of work for um, probably 10 years now. And we can get two to four uh, implants in in about 20 minutes. So it, it's very non-invasive local anesthesia only, um, and it works very well. These are two different simulators. This, this simulator um, is very, very small, and it fits in very, very well, but it doesn't have a power source. 
uh, it can be trained, it can be taught to be turned on and off at certain spots, but it doesn't have an internal power source. This um, device is being developed and it has a power source in it, so it's got a battery in it. So you charge the battery once or twice a week at night while everybody's sleeping and it runs whenever you want to turn it on during the day. Okay. So it's, it's pretty nifty. Um, so those things are being uh, evaluated by the FDA at the moment. They could be available within the next few years. Okay. Would that be for risk or for harm? They um, it could be, you could use it almost anywhere. Um, anywhere where you have a, a fair amount of room to place an electrode. So in the dorsiflexion program, we put it in the muscle belly itself. Um, we don't really try to find the, the perineal nerve, we just slide it into the muscle belly. And the electrodes are on this side and this side, so that makes it a completely controlled circuit, okay? And you have equipment that you program it with, uh, so that another thing that's nice about these is one thing that we're working on is developing is sensors from the stimulators so that we can use the tilt center sensor uh, if it's part of the actual implant. And that way we don't have to use any external equipment. So you basically turn it on, use it all day, take it off, turn it off, and um, it's ready to go for the next morning. So long-term management, we're looking at uh, implanted systems. Okay? Now in some of your upper, it's, we haven't used it in the upper extremities, at least as far as I know, nobody's used it in the upper extremities. But some of this um, shoulder abduction that your children have <coughs> along with their um, flexion, this is something that could be developed into a, um, an orthotic treatment that would just be basically continuously on. Get up in the morning, turn it on, it allows them to relax their hand a little better, and then we would make it either so that it wasn't so strong that they couldn't break through it to do a biceps contraction if they wanted to, um, but they can have a more relaxed posture through the whole day. Okay, so these are some things that are in the offing that we can expect to see in the fairly near future. So I said check back for further developments. Okay, this stimulator, this is one end, this is one end of the stimulator. It's, they're very compact and very nice. We have used these for shoulder subluxation in our stroke patients. We have used these for wrist extension uh, and finger extension. Um, we've also used them in the butt uh, for our spinal cord injury patients that sit for long periods of time. And they are prone to pressure sores because they don't have sensation. And so they sit and they don't, sh they don't jiggle like y'all j are jiggling really nicely. So you don't sit still. Um, and, but somebody who's had a spinal cord injury does because they don't feel like they need to move. And so we're using these uh, in the butt to give them a strong muscle contraction, raise them up a little bit, and relax and do that. Normally we tell our spinal cord patients you need to, every 15 minutes, you need to raise your bottom up off the chair and hold it for 15 seconds and put it back down. Well, that's, that's good in theory, but they get involved with something and they don't know when 15 minutes went by. So that's not very effective. Whereas the simulator that we use, we can do it automatically and um, just be able to uh, do that action for them. So these are, these are things that you will be seeing in the future. Many, many applications, um, depending on what we want to, to, uh, to follow up with. So physiologically, what do we know that we're doing? We've known for years that with electrical stimulation, we're getting spinal cord activation of spinal reflexes. So we use, for the, the spasticity treatment, we use what's called reciprocal inhibition. So if we've got a spastic biceps, we go to the triceps, which will then allow 
the, um, if we drive the triceps, it will inhibit the biceps, okay? So it's reciprocal. And it works on virtually everybody. Um, so that's a, a, a wonderful technique. Um, but we don't know what we're doing in the brain when we're talking about um, motor control. So we want to increase the patient's ability to recruit their muscles from their own brain, not just from our peripherally applied stimulation. And there are now several, not a huge number, FRI, FRI, FMRI, can you almost say that? So it's functional magnetic resonance imaging. Okay? And what we're looking at here is a change in the amount of blood vessel or blood activity that's in being developed by the muscle or by de being developed in the brain um, as somebody uses ele an electrical stimulation treatment program. So we know from, and I don't have a slide of the one that, we know if we turn on the stimulation just at sensory levels, the primary sensory cortex picks up that signal. But you know what? It sends it over to the primary motor cortex. We're not stimulating anything that's motor. We're stimulating the primary sensory cortex, but it communicates with the motor cortex. And that motor cortex then makes it more easily excited by the patient, okay? So I don't have that slide, but I do have slides of fMRI findings uh, over variable treatment times, and we can kind of map the activity change with motor learning. So this, this diagram actually is not an fMRI one, but it, what it's showing is with voluntary contraction, how much activity is there in the brain? And the green line is the one that we really want to look at here. So the green line under a voluntary wrist extension uh, contraction <coughs> is not very good, okay? And it's even worse when it's used by stimulation alone. So if the patient's not trying to uh, respond, then there's, no, there's really nothing going on in the brain. When we combine electrical stimulation with the electrical stimulation, I'm sorry, when we combine electrical stimulation with the voluntary, we see that we get a much, much higher level of activation. And this is what we're trying to, oh, yes, I do have that, don't I? Okay, he doesn't want to be walking around there. <laughs> so this is what we're trying to do when we're using stimulation as a motor control. We're trying to increase the brain's ability to activate the muscles that we're after, and we're kind of directing that activity with our electrical stimulation, okay? So a combined voluntary and stimulated contraction is a lot more effective at increasing blood flow in the brain at the uh, primary motor cortex. I got too many things in my hand. Okay, here's an fMRI. This is what you're more used to seeing. Um, this is a MRI that's superimposed onto a CT scan. And the MRI is what's this bright stuff up here, okay? Um, and what we're looking at is um, using the, this to look at how much uh, does changes with the practice uh, when the practice includes fMRI, or I'm sorry, electrical stimulation. So pre-therapy efforts, um, this is a sagittal view, and you see a whole lot of activity. This is, this part here is primarily sensory cortex. This part down here is motor. Then when we go to a uh, frontal view, we say this is the side that we're stimulating in the periphery. But you see while the patient attempts to uh, do the, the activity, he's bringing in everything he's got. Think about when you learned to ride a bicycle. Did you do it just flowing smoothly? No, you bring in every single muscle you've got. And that's usually the problem that we see with a lot of our, our folks that have impaired motor control. They try to, t they tense up everything in an effort to um, get what they're after. And a lot of times they bring in muscles we don't want them to. So we don't want them to work at that high of a level. So here is the uninvolved side in this stroke patient, and this is um, the involved side. 
This is pre-therapy. And then here we're on a coronal section, and you can again see it's all on the wrong side. So there was therapy that was given for four weeks using electrical stimulation to augment the um, voluntary activation of the hand. And you see what we call focusing of the uh, area here on the, the sagittal plane. This was all active, but now a much smaller area is active. That's typical of skilled movements. And here we have a lot of activity on the uninvolved side. Now it's almost all on the involved side and is contributing to the, the more natural movement. Same thing over here. We uh, switch the activity from the uh, uninvolved side to the side that, where there had been damage. And you can see that it's relatively well focused. Okay? Same concept here. These are coronal and sagittal uh, plane movements. And the training was, this is pre-training, this is electrical stimulation, this is voluntary, this is electrical stimulation with voluntary, and this is just voluntary, okay? So we see, again, we see just general activation here, and by the time we got through the, the eight-week treatment program, we have a much more organized type of uh, response. The right parts of the brain are being activated, and everything else in the world is not. Okay? So that's helpful, uh, so that it allows the individual to move their extremity more, more purposefully without exciting everything in the, in the whole limb. So, does NMES add uh, to the effect of traditional therapy? Yes, it does. It adds short term, it also adds long term, depending on how it's being used. But, it must be used integrated with functional activity. Just having a patient sit and the extremity moving with the electrical stimulation is not an effective treatment program. That's a misuse of technology. It has to be integrated with all other activities that are going on. So if you're doing hand therapy uh, or upper extremity therapy, they need to be working. They need to be playing with their favorite toy or moving something from here to there. And then the stimulation needs to be um, used in a manner that would allow that limb to function independently. Thank you. Um, and it is more effective in skilled hands. So I have, I have been, and, and I've talked with a lot of folks from this uh, meeting for a number of years now, and I hear from parents that this sounds really exciting, but my therapist doesn't know anything about it and doesn't know what to do with it, okay? And I have to hang my head in shame because they should. Um, your physical therapists have uh, a fair amount of education in the area of electrical stimulation and how to use it and how to use it effectively. So there's actually no excuse that they don't know what to do with it. And the occupational therapists I, I work with both OTPT and speech therapists at Rancho. The occupational therapist and the speech therapist, don't, they have a better excuse because it's not part of their curriculum. But they pick it up in sort of uh, con ed, extra school activities, okay? It's very, very effective in pediatrics. Our children's hospital at, at, at Los Angeles is very actively engaged with both strengthening and motor re-educating um, their patients with electrical stimulation. And it works, some, sometimes my students say, oh, well, you know, it feels funny, I don't like it. One of the beauties of pediatrics is they don't know it feels funny. If you say, oh, that feels good, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, sure it does, Mom. <laughs> the tickle machine. <laughs> A tickle machine, That's yes. what we call it, the tickle machine. Yeah. Or, you know, I always say to my adults, it's like a vibration. Because, you know, sometimes my students will say, 
Uh, well, it's like ants crawling on your skin. I'm going, ah. <laughs> that's not something I want, but a little vibration, a tickle, that kind of thing works. Um, so therapists are in a position to be knowledgeable about electrical stimulation if they do a little homework. However, you are the one that sees your kid every day. And it doesn't take a lot of finesse to figure out how to make some of these programs work. You need a good motor point chart or a upper extremity or lower extremity anatomy uh, and look to see where the muscle is, try it on yourself, figure out where you should be putting the stimulators and put them on and go with it. So you, you, you need to have probably some help from your therapist, whatever therapist it is, um, at the very beginning. But who's gonna do it day by day? Most of your kids aren't seeing therapy every day, but they're seeing you every day. And so if you can set aside 10 minutes, 15 minutes, to work with them on a, a specific skill, an upper extremity skill, a lower extremity skill, you will become the effective hands, the skilled hands. And you will be the ones that will be able to direct that therapy. You don't have to wait for somebody from the outside. Okay? So, um, I, I will say that if your therapists want to contact me, fine. I don't have any problem with that. Um, but you need to set goals for them. I want my child to be able to walk with a foot that dorsiflex. I want my child to be walked with, walk with a knee extended. I want my child to be able to open their hand. I want my child to have a relaxed posture at the elbow um, during their daily activities. And you set the goal. They'll help you identify what muscles need to be stimulated, whether it's an uh, inhibitory program or whether it's an excitatory facilitation program. And most of our stimulators have some way to turn them on and turn them off. That means you have a switch, a trigger, that you can use to turn it on and turn it off during the appropriate phases of activity. So. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really frustrated that I have to do this, but the therapists just are not on top of it. And they should be. And I can't do anything but make excuses for them and hang my hand because I teach the PTs. Um, but, you know, it, it, you need to be aware of the technology. You need to be aware of how it should be used appropriately and, and optimally. And you need to insist that you get the best treatment for your kids. Hands-on is great. Electrical stimulation is one more thing that you can do to facilitate them. Okay? So I think that's it. Yes? So any questions? Yes? Um, your thoughts on the wearable stimulation devices, the sleeves and things like that, actiobionics. Um, I totally hear your point about you. I'm oh, sorry. Your thoughts on the um, wearable stimulation um, sleeves and devices like axiobionics. Um, totally take your point about you can't just slap something on and expect it to do therapy on its own that needs to be functional and things like that. But my understanding is some of these devices, and we were on the fence about going to Michigan and getting evaluated and whatnot before we commit to all that. Kind of your thoughts on, on that technology? I, I think it's great. The wearables are good because it gives you a certain flexibility of where your electrodes are going to be. Okay, um, some of the orthotics are not as flexible. And so you wind up with the electrodes where the, the manufacturer wants them to be and not necessarily where it's best for your kid. The, by the way, the dorsiflexion systems are made in children's size. And so is the hand system is made in children's size. Um, but even so, there's variability from subject to subject, so you need to find your best electrode placement. Like I say, you're your best, I always tell my student, you've got a cheat sheet built in for your electro exam. It's yourself. Look at your own muscles. What are you after? Where is it? Put your electrode there. Oh gee, it works. Um, so I like the wearables because you can be a little more flexible about how you set them up. But you have to be careful that you get them on in the same position each day, okay? 
But yeah, I think uh, wearables in the, like the upper extremity would be easily managed with wearables um, if you wanted to do a more long-term spasticity management program. That would make it very, very doable. Now, I would not pay an arm and a leg. Sorry. <laughs> um, it should not cost you thousands of dollars, especially wearables shouldn't. Is anyone having this, any left coverage insurance? Is it, does anyone have Axio Yeah? Do you want to share, do you want to share your screen? Oh, sure. Sorry, I don't want to hijack you. Yeah. That's right. We have axial biotics. It's been a huge difference for Lauren. We have it on her both legs and arm. And she actually wears the arm one to school. So, um, but it was expensive. That's for sure. But it was, you know, one of the things they do is she went up there and was measured in a, a thousand different places. Yeah. Right? So, so they made sure it fit. Exactly for her. That's right. Why. That was more the expense than anything else. It was just you know, getting the exact measurements and making sure it was right, and then, um, because hers are custom. So it kind of depends. Like you said, you don't have to spend that much money. Ours is not covered by insurance, and it was expensive. So yeah. it's just a matter. But she's, um, Lauren's in a situation where she walks, but she has uh, muscle. She really needs her muscles to um, be stronger. So she walks with braces and stuff. Also, we were having troubles with braces, years and years of blisters. So we had a lot of extenuating circumstances that led us to this path that was worth it for us. Uh, so I think everyone's different. But, um, and she was, she's always been really close to walking, but never can like, quite make that on her own. So like at home, she walks, but we don't let her walk out in public. At school, she walks with someone. But, you know, never unassisted or with someone else. At least not at this point. Not at this point, yeah. Okay, now I did not talk about using electrical stimulation to strengthening, but it is a very valuable way yeah, of work on strengthening. Because yeah. Because that's her biggest issue. It's just, she's really small and skinny and doesn't have the muscles, and that's her well, biggest issue. Well, small and skinny means she doesn't have the demand either. Yeah, right. <laughs> if she was big and heavy, we would be in trouble. Yeah. The biomechanics definitely changes. And the sooner, I, I've been hearing this in several of the sessions that I've said in on, the sooner you start doing a therapeutic intervention, the better off you're going to be. Um, but like I say, every time your kid goes through a growth spurt, the biomechanics change. So you have to beef up their um, strength again. Um, and the, the wearables, it, and I don't know how many channels you're using. Okay, the, the wearables are something that you can, again, have a, a trial run with just surface stimulation and be able to demonstrate that they, in fact, make a difference in what the child is capable of doing, what the strength might be, uh, how it might be changing, and have your therapist write a justification for that based on your experience with your child. And that, that makes a huge difference. Yes. Could I have you have your last slide up just for any purpose? Sorry. That's all right. Thank you. Okay. Have you heard of um, the neural suit at all? Again, it's just, it's a wearable. Yeah. So there's a lot of that coming around. I mean, it, it's not that hard a technology to incorporate. So it, a lot of it depends on what do you need to work on. Um, if you need to work on everything, maybe the neural suit is good. But if, I, I find that usually there's one or two things. If you can make a difference in one or two things, it's going to make a difference in that child's life. And I, I discourage my therapist from trying to do everything at once. They do an evaluation. They say, well, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this, we can do this. Yes, what can you do most effectively? What's going to make the biggest change? Work on that. 
when you get it, then find something else to work on. So I'm not a big um, fan of scatter. Let's just stimulate everything and see what we get. Um, I, I tell my therapist, you have, to, you have to tell me what you want to do. What's your goal? Before you ever ask me about what to do with electrical stimulation. So if you don't have a goal, then I don't have a treatment. So uh, I get that a lot from therapists around the country. I get that some from the branch of therapists that um, they'll give me a patient and say, well, we want to do something to stimulate them. I was like, okay, what do you want to do? <laughs> and uh, I've had two patients at Rancho recently that one was a high spinal cord patient, see one spinal cord patient that wanted some neck stability. And uh, we were, were working on that with him. And then I had actually a dystrophy patient, a muscular dystrophy patient um, that needed gluteal stimulation, which fortunately she was small and um, we were able to get to the gluteus maximus and medius. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of doing what's gonna be most important first. And if you get success there, move on to the second program. Yeah. I'm wondering if you have experience or if you come across my move, the eight channel upper extremity. Um, the Maya move. Yeah. Move. Might move. Same thing. It's, it's still, yeah. I find when I first started doing electrical stimulation, I had three channels of stimulation and I worked well with it. But most of the therapists on the floor with me were not tolerating it very well. So most of our commercial devices have come down to two uh, channels, and that's something that a therapist manages reasonably well. When you start doing uh, four, five, six, eight channels, that becomes an engineering feat. Yeah, no, it is. It's computerized. Yeah. It's definitely not controlled by anybody but a computer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, you know... I, Robotics are great, computers are great, as long as they're working for you and you're not working for them. So you gotta be careful about that. I mean, I've, I've had times when I've had the engineers come in and help us set up a nine channel stimulator. Um, but it's not, it's, it's a wanna see, can do, is it possible sort of thing. It's, it's not, I try to pare it down as quickly as I can into two or three channels. Yeah. Um, what about electrical stimulation for individuals uh, that are older? Like for, for instance, uh, someone that's had a hemisphere when they were 18, 1981, when they were one. Okay. So older patients are no different. Actually, the majority of the research has been done in stroke patients because they're a relatively homogeneous population and they have similar kinds of problems across the board. So the majority of the work that has been done in electrical stimulation from the 70s forward have been in stroke patients. Some in spinal cord patients, but most of it has been in stroke patients. It works very well. They need strengthening programs a lot of times, especially if it's been since 1981. Um, they probably have pretty wimpy muscles. And so you have to build up some strength, and then once you've got strength, you can start looking at it in a functional way and make a decision about whether or not you can make it functional enough for them to use without the stimulation or whether you're gonna need a long-term stimulation program. Yeah, it's definitely a possibility. Um, you were saying about therapists. We have, to, as in the last 10 years, it's been difficult because they'll say, okay, he's older, you know. My experience is in writing my tests, I always make my older patients about 40 because they can't perceive of anything older than that. Well, you could, you're not doing much anyways. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so yes, the young therapists don't have a real appreciation for what, what could be done with somebody who is quote unquote older. <laughs> but you can, you can gain strength um, and you can use that strength then and re-educate that strength and put it into a functional activity and it works just as well in a 91-year-old as it does in an 11-year-old. Okay, so I'll just keep persisting. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.